Hey guys, Steven here, Fanatic Perspective. Tran and I are here, finally got our thoughts together after rewatching the spring game. And Tran, we had a blast yesterday out there at the stadium seeing the south end zone almost complete at this point. Dude, it was really fun to be out there with you, brother. Yeah, it was great. It was just, just it was a fun atmosphere. It was, I mean, you miss football, honestly. And now it was just a little tease until until fall. But you know, it's it, it was it was a beautiful day. Uh, got to meet a lot of nice people out there, and you know, I appreciate appreciate you being able to go with me. Absolutely. Shout out to our brothers over at Texas Platinum, who we got to see. And many of you guys saw the uh, picture we posted on Twitter. And by the way, if you're not following us on Twitter, make sure you hit that you know follow button. And um, but Texas Platinum, Trevor, Matt Myers, it was really cool seeing you guys and chatting it up for a little bit. Mr. Eisenhower, we saw you out there. Ben Reza, we saw you, who's constantly you know helping us out on all socials. So. Really cool just to interact with many of you guys that follow us and recognize us at the game. So that was that was really, really nice. Um, make sure, by the way, just quick plugs before we get into the meat of this. Uh, we're almost, we're what, under 500 people at this point to 10K. So we're getting really, really close. Uh, don't ask for much, but if you rock with us, if you enjoy what we're saying, our conversations, hit that subscribe button, hit the like button. Really appreciate it. It helps us grow our platform. Now, um, Tran, before we get into our seven key takeaways, because I think we've, through our conversations, we've condensed it down into some things. We will be having a live chat discussion this week to really go and review every minute detail of the game. But today is going to be more so just after rewatching the game a second time. Because, you know, when you get the game, you get distracted with a lot of different things yeah. and a spring game atmosphere was cool. So we'll get into our and seven. I, and I had to be an idiot and leave my kids' uh, baseball stuff in my car and I had to leave early. So. <laughs> <laughs> so. Oh, man. But, uh, hey, your son played well in the in the back-to-backs yesterday. So shout out yeah, to little Jordan. Um, the big, big thing, though, before I get into our seven takeaways, I think the overall big takeaway for, for me – is number one, nobody got hurt. It's always good. And I thought they had they, they had a really good spring considering people staying healthy. But Tran, I thought the culture just seemed different in a good way. I thought it was laid back. I thought they were really encouraging people, when I say people, the players, to have fun. And I think that was one of the recurring things what we were hearing about yesterday was football's fun again. Yeah, no, uh, not only that, you could also judge it by all the alumni that were on the sidelines. You could see them just uh, coming in in droves, just different different little clicks of there, and they were all having fun themselves. You know, Kenny Vaccaro, uh, Brian Arakpo were sitting there talking in front of us. Um, they just just having them there. I mean, yes, other spring practices they would have have other ones, but it wasn't. It wasn't like the fraternity. I think is the is the thing that you kept you kept talking about for, in pregame is just making sure that they have that rapport with the the alumni, the people that have been through the been through the program and also in the NFL. So you know, just mm. having that visualization there uh, to back up the coaches on how to get them to that next level. It just it just I think it means tons, and it allows the kids to not worry about an issue that they that they may do on a, on one play or or a mess up or on on an assignment uh but actually learn from it use this as a learning experience to get them better for for actual for the actual gameplay i i completely agree and they just seem to be doing a good job of interacting even throughout the game interacting with the players coaching up but it didn't seem like people were getting embarrassed or undressed and look playing at texas it's always going to be pressure. Playing D1 football, period, it's going to be pressure. Many of these guys played high school football in the state of Texas or played, came from very, very large high school football programs where there was a ton of pressure. I think one of the if, – if the previous regime, staff, whatever you want to call them, could do it over again, maybe they applied too much pressure on top of the pressure that's already inherently there instead of encouraging them to be loose, have fun, play free. Right. Like whatever you do, like even the way Steve Sarkeesian speaks, it, it, the, the demeanor is as he sounds like a teacher, but he's also like 
upbeat, fun. It's like, hey, you know, like the, the charisma is definitely there, but you want your team to kind of inherit that personality, right? Like we're not arrogant, but we also feel like if we do what we're supposed to do and go out there, like it's not only we're going to win, like winning is important, but we're here, we're going to have a good time. We're enjoying playing with each other. And I, I just I thought that was something just even listening to some of the broadcast team on the rewatch that they were really driving home was football's fun. And and you want to see your players having fun. You want to see them having a good time because that's going to lead to a lot of success. Um, let's get into our seven key takeaways, because I think these are just again, we're not this is about the spring game, but it's also just after watching it, seeing people in person, seeing everything play out. This is just kind of what we're thinking. So. Here's number one, Tran. And I know a lot of people are going to be like, well, let's talk about the quarterbacks. Of course, we'll get to the quarterbacks. <laughs> or a lot but of people regardless, like, yeah, we know that. <laughs> we know he's right, the best right, player. right. <laughs> we know that, but it needs to. But it was, it was. I'll I'll make this statement, then I'll pass it over to you. I already knew Bijan Robinson was the best player on the team. I think we knew that at the end of last season. Yeah. I think that has now been emphasized in terms of him being showcased, but I also think he's now the most important player on the team too, right? Like this was a game where I, I was like, man, if he plays, he may play a series or two, they take him out. They re this, this, this team, this offense is built around five Tran. Oh yeah. Yeah, it is. And things that I noticed about him is that he's so good. He makes the offensive line better. Like there was bigger holes, his cuts, his balance, his vision, everything about him. It's so amazing to see this at such a young age that he's just that good. He's he, <laughs> I've never really thought that there was anything of a prodigy in football or anything like that because it's something that has to go through hard work and everything like that. But it's just that he has all the intangibles to be to be great. And just seeing him that first that first series, I was good with seeing him just for the first series. And then also later on in the uh, at the end of the second quarter for the two-minute drill because we wanted to see how how everything was working and clicking with, with your ones in there correctly. But I didn't need to see anything else other than that. Just like, yep, check the box. He's that good. Um, everyone's, everyone's telling me, like, are you being serious about you don't want him to get hit and things like that? I'm like, no, no, I, I, I don't mind him getting hit. You know, it's a, you, ha you have to you have to be acclimated yeah. to actual physical, but I don't want him to get hurt at the same time. And we saw we saw at the end of the game, no reason for him to be there at the end of the game with three minutes left. Him getting Gator roll, his ankle just tweaked. It's, even a tweak on his ankle could be some huge down the line. So I, I, I do want to to protect him as much as possible because he's that good for us and he is our offense right now. And I have no problem with them building the offense around five. He's your best player. One of the, the biggest criticisms we've had over and over again is not getting the ball in the right people's hands, not showcasing, showcasing your best players. And not only is he going to be showcased, but it's it's in a diverse manner. The way he's going to be used in the passing game. And I, I think I asked you this question while we were sitting there. I'm like, shout out to our, our friends over at Eyes on Texas and my, and my boy Alistair who has been driving this point on his channel and then when I'm talking to him about Najee Harris catching 43 passes last year. And and uh, Tran, oh, and I asked you this yesterday, over under 40 catches on the year for B. John Robinson. Me personally, I'm inclined to go over with what I'm seeing. So I think he's going to catch a lot of passes. I would say that, but I think Roshan is also a complete, uh, can also catch out of the, backfield and I think he's going to be put in there as well so so I think it may eat into that he may well get that because the the snap counts in the in the big 12 are going to be 80 to 90 snaps a game for the offenses could he get could he get five catches a game yeah could he have games where he gets 11 catches and only five rushes and that's just what's clicking for him yeah it could be that so uh, but I, I would say at this point, probably under in my mindset. But I mean, he, he it definitely could go either way. Well, I, I think I think he's going to be carrying the ball. Yes, probably somewhere between twenty to you know upwards of twenty five times a game. 
I think we, we to your point though of the depending five on the needs depending, depending on, on the needs, needs. yeah yeah, yeah depending, depending on the yeah. needs absolutely absolutely because there could be there could be there could be some games where it's a little lighter we saw that with Najee Harris where it was a little lighter but he had they made up for the touches in the pass game yeah. my whole thing is with the running backs as long as he's getting the ball in an effective manner to create I I'm agree. good as I that agree. that's what I'm looking for because to your point we could have a team we're facing that is just dominant up the middle and it makes more sense for us to hammer their perimeters and, and get people the ball in different ways. Going back to what Steve Sarkeesian has been preaching, the more you can do well, the more dangerous you are. So them utilizing B. John Robinson, great point with Roshan Johnson because Roshan Johnson is actually the reason why I think B. John Robinson won't be overused, right? Mm -hmm. Because you have – one of the things he even talked about was like, I have – Roshan Johnson is probably one of the better – number two running backs that Steve's really had. I mean, it, you know, in all, a lot of the different offenses he's been on people, people go with the narrative that he's, he's, you know, he's going to, he's going to have a bell cow, which is, which is a correct one. But in situations where he's had two guys, like, you know, even he, and I know he wasn't the offensive coordinator for USC, but they had Lindo white and Reggie Bush. Right. And they both ate. And I'm not saying that the, the usage is going to be split like that per se, but I do think that Roshan Johnson is so good in his own right and is, is versatile enough in his own right to where you can you can manage Bijan's touches mm -hmm. really well with always having five fresh to be as effective as possible for you. So I think they're in a good position. I also think because they're so strong as a group, that helps whoever's playing quarterback. To your point. Helps whoever's blocking, like as a block as as the offensive line, because you could clearly see a difference with the way the offensive line blocks for the run, and when they're asked to pass block. Yeah. And pass blocking, I think natively is harder for offensive linemen as is. But when you have somebody like Bijan Robinson, gives you confidence. It gives you confidence. <laughs> yeah, it gives Absolutely. you confidence. Because I don't think you're perfect. If I just get a little bit of a seal, this dude's gone. Yeah, he's gone. <laughs> You get, so you, you give him one back block and uh, you give him one back block uh, um, and he, he has one cut and he's gone too. I mean, it's, I mean, and it, as, as an offensive lineman, you, you're, you're excited to block for him because it makes, it makes your job so Absolutely. much easier. Absolutely. Now, Bijan, he's, he's so important. I think his personality vibes very well with, the culture that Steve Sarkeesian is looking to implement. I think it's an inclusive culture where they're trying to get people to come in this program and say, hey, Texas is not just a place anymore where you're going to come and not get developed or get frustrated or people are going to have unrealistic expectations. Like, come here. We're building up a culture of fun. We're going to build up a culture where people are going to be showcased once again. And you, and because we do know that at Texas, like Bijan Robinson has the potential to be looked at in the same regard as a Earl Campbell, as a Ricky Williams. Like, so when a player does come here and hit, you're a, you're a legend. Mm -hmm. You're a legend, and I do think that is a unique thing about Texas. Like, look at the way people still talk about Vince Young, Colt McCoy. Like, there's it's it's it is a different air when you can do things like that. So. I think what Bijan is is on his way to hopefully, um, you know, hopefully achieving as a as a football player here. Hopefully, that's an example to other great players that want to come and, and and play under Steve Sarkeesian at Texas. Now we just talked about the running back helping the quarterback. Let's get into the quarterback conversation. My personal takeaway from the game yesterday and now rewatching this. I I honestly look at this as the quarterbacks are a little bit more of a strength than I initially thought and uh, overall with the team. I think Casey Thompson and Hudson Card are actually two of my better football players just in general. I think the issue is you can only play one person. And I think what Casey Thompson can do for you very, very well is 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 almost a different style of offense than what Hudson Card can do. Casey Thompson, if you notice, they start the game, they go 12 personnel heavy. We'll get to that in a second. 
But I look at the type of offense that, you know, the bootleg things that Casey Thompson can do because he's so good throwing on the run. I think you saw that yesterday, especially the connection and that little sync that he already has with, with Jordan Whittington in particular. I'm not saying Casey Thompson's bad throwing from the pocket, but he's not Hudson Card from a comfortable standpoint in terms of hitting that back foot quick, you know, arm strength, all those those NFL-ish type things that Hudson Card just naturally has. I do think Casey Thompson probably has a little bit better feel of the offense overall and how to navigate under pressure and, and, and within the pocket. The turnover. The the because the Hail Mary, that's that's whatever. The the pick six to Deshaun Jameson, that's how you lose the job. Mm-hmm. Let's be very, very blunt about this. If you're the older guy and you and you're you're make A, you're making a decision like that, B, you're not understanding the limitations of what you can and cannot do with your arm, and you're late. You do those things. And the situation too. The situation it was in too. So it being the two minute drill, and mm-hmm. you're trying to put points on the board, and no matter what, even even if you if you settle for a field goal, it's a ten point swing in the game. And he threw it on the inside inside of the route instead of outside. It you know it's Deshaun Jameson's licking his fingers for that. You know he's like, oh, I'm eating on this one. Absolutely. So, so uh, yeah. Uh, that you're you're absolutely right. That was a very bad pass. It was and that is something that if it is if the QB race is as tight as it is, um, it it definitely can it definitely can affect your your placement of of the in the depth chart. You know what's interesting about that interception? I think there was like a, a stoppage in play or a timeout. I, I don't recall exactly what it was, but it, it was it was a hold. It was, was there, okay. There was I think there was a hold or. Uh, because it was a penalty. Because we we mm-hmm. we were really sloppy on the two minute drill. I'll be honest with you. Because I was, think there was two penalties: one illegal guy down the field, and then also a hold. That uh, so on that particular drive, though, what what I was, was uh, the the team was was a little. I agree with you. The team was a little sloppy. I thought before that throw, Casey Thompson was looking tremendous on the drill on the, on the drive. Though he had made two really really nice throws. The the I think it was like a dig route to O'Meary that he hit on. And then the throw on the outside, which may have been his best throw of the day to Whittington. Whittington, yep. Right. So that particular two-minute drill up until the, the pick six, which kills you, literally kills you, he he looked like he not only was on point throwing the football from a myriad of platforms, but had complete control of the situation, what was going on. So that was very, very, very disappointing to see, in my opinion, in regards to Casey Thompson. I do think Casey Thompson's day is looked at differently if Joshua Moore catches that ball on the very, very first drive. Because if you think about context right there, they start the game, B. John Robinson's looking good, Casey has good time in the pocket, like the offense is, we're seeing Steve Sarkeesian offense. They take the deep shot, Joshua Moore beats his man, doesn't finish on the play, you you want to give credit to Schooley for, for, for fighting through the ball all the way through, cool. And I think, but I do think that you see that you're like, oh damn, that's the dude we saw throwing those deep shots in the Colorado game. He's here again. Mm-hmm. You, you see what I'm saying? So perception there does matter. I do think though, when they're in the quarterback room grading, he gets a big check for for that play, even though because that's 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 oh, perfect. the receiver. It was a, per- it was a perfect right. play. It was perfect placement. Great, great pass. Um, so yeah, I, it, that's not his fault as well. That's a win. No. But in terms of the RPO stuff that Steve Sarkeesian likes to do, and this is where all the intrigue comes in with Hudson Card, because how, at what point do you say the upside is, is so great that I want to go in this direction? And not only is the upside great with this player, but he does seem to have a better fit for, I would say, more what Tua was doing. I know he, he said it, he's like a combo of Tua and Mac Jones. I see a lot of two in terms of just his ball handling and, and, and ability to get the ball out quick, different angles. I think Hudson has a very, very lively arm, and he throws. The thing that Tua did was throw with anticipation. And the highlight throw of the day was Hudson Carter, Marcus Washington, on on that touchdown where, you know, he, he essentially throws Marcus Washington open. Mar- Marcus yeah. Washington is covered. 
He throws him. He throws him open. I, I know a lot of people have been talking about that today. That's what you get with Hudson Card. But the thing is, is are you willing to s- start that guy, risk Casey Thompson outright? Now we, I think we, I think everyone's really starting to get to the point that. So can can I? Sark can is I, not going to have a starter until the week of the game. Of yeah, I, I, well, I, I agree with that. Or maybe a week, uh, uh, two weeks away from that game, or something like that. But uh, since you brought up Tua. One thing that was bothering me throughout re-watching the game was how they were saying that we don't want our quarterbacks to run. We don't want our quarterback. Do you think that Tua's injury is the reason why he doesn't want his quarterbacks running, number one? Hmm. Um, I think that's something that's, – that's a very interesting point. I think it's it goes back to, like, the even, like, when he had Jake Locker, though. Like, and, and he didn't want him – Jake Locker was a real true dual-threat quarterback with Tyrone Willingham and, and those guys. And then mm-hmm. he comes in and he's, he wants to showcase him as a pro. And, and to, to Sars' credit, Jake Locker, I think, went in the top 10. Yep. Still in the NFL draft. But I, I think that's just like going, you know, the people that he's had, whether it's Carson Palmer, Matt Leinart, you know, Cody Kessler, through the Alabama guys, even Matt Ryan when he was in the NFL, they've always been a certain type of quarterback. Yeah. Is, it is no, what because- it is. Because what, what you're doing is you're taking away a little bit of what makes Casey Thompson so good. I, I, there was a couple times in the game, game where, hey, Casey Thompson could have taken off and gotten 10, 15 yards, forced to pass downfield. Now, is there a middle ground that uh, that Coach Sark would do where he's like, okay, hey, if you know you can get five, six yards, because I think a five, six yard is a huge win on an offensive play. Five, six yards. I think that's a huge win because, you know, if you get two of those, it's first down, honestly. So if you can get – if you know you can get that and they get down, do that. Is there is there any middle ground for him for that? Because that changes that changes the complexity of the offense and, and the complexity of who you want to select as a QB. Because what you want to do is you want to get the defense tired. How do you get the defense tired? Keep moving the – keep moving the sticks. Mm-hmm. And if you could – and if you had that dynamic extra threat there, because, you know – Honestly, the arm strength there there is a difference in arm strength, but is it so much difference where you're just like, this is this is how we have to go through. This is what we want to go through. And you know, we we may even go Hudson Card too, anyways, because Hudson Card is not a he's not a non-athletic player. He's very he can athletic, run and he can and he can scramble as well. But if you take away that one portion of the game, I think it it allows the defense to kind of evolve to where they could drop and just say, hey, you know, we don't even need to spy this this quarterback anymore because their game plan is they're not going to run him. I mean, I, I, I think I think your first point is where I'm at. He has to find a happy medium with it, especially if it's going to be Casey Thompson. I don't want them to eliminate all quarterback run outright. Mm-hmm. OK, yeah, I'm just saying I don't want my quarterback leading the team and rushing. I don't want my quarterback no, no, being I, my only short yardage. Me that too. that that was my problem with with Herman and and even when Yersic was still that like they wouldn't get away from that and I know that was part of what sa- made Sam Sam, but mo- moving forward you can't just strip Casey like there's a particular play and I know I think it was just because of the screen game where I know for a fact where he flipped it to Gabe uh, Gabriel Watson and it was a drop and I know for a fact he's running with that in in a, in a game situation and I think that medium is even what we saw in the Colorado game he didn't take off every other time he, yeah. he was he was moving to throw but would you, if i'm stark would i mix in just enough of a little bit of zone read every now and again to keep the defense honest and to 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 at least make people hand at the threat that i have a kid that probably runs in the four or fives that could take off on your ass like i have i think sark should mix that in or else he's doing himself a disservice if he Decides to go with Casey Thompson as quarterback. I think Hudson Card can do that too. Yeah, by the Hudson way, Hudson Card, absolutely. People, right. So people just say that it's it's all Casey because he's he's athletic. Right. But he but if you watch Hudson Card's high school video, I mean he he used to be a, a wide receiver. He was a thousand yard receiver. I like yeah. Travis. Like, <laughs> so, I can run. Yeah, he can okay. run. He can run. <laughs> and, and, and but the thing is, you want to do it with in moderation. You want to, if you're going to do it, if you're Steve Sarkeesian. Now, Sarks may say, I really don't want them running. Like, I think they're they're actually probably even faster straight line athletes than Tua was. Tua was, was pretty athletic guy and, and has really, really good 
movement and creative skills. But the thing that Sark was able to master with Tua was the quick decision making and him just being creative in terms of identifying stuff very, very fast. That's where they got to with Mac Jones as well. And I know that's what he's looking to develop them as quarterbacks is using their mind as creativity. But, you know, guys are different. Right. And I think with with Casey Thompson. Uh, especially, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with, especially if they're going to hammer bootleg a lot and get him outside of the pocket, because I think that's the one thing he probably does have a leg up on Hudson Card on is the, you on know, the run. on the run throwing. And, and he, he seems to be a little bit more comfortable doing that than Hudson is. If they're just going to be a straight up pocket passing competition, Hudson Card will be the starter by the end of the season. If that's if that's if there's no movement on that, then. Even I don't care if Casey Thompson wins the job for Louisiana. I think it's more important on who's your starting quarterback going to conference play and who's going to finish the season as a starter. I think that would be Hudson Card. If that's if that's all they're looking for, he's going to fit that profile better 10 out of 10 times. Now, if they want to incorporate some of the things we see from Kyle Shanahan, some of the things we've seen from the Cleveland Browns with Baker Mayfield and getting them moving on the pocket with a dominant with dominant running backs, Right. And, and a lot of outside zone and, and getting them on the move and using the tight ends, then Casey Thompson can do that very, very effectively. Yes. But I think a bigger takeaway, though, is let them battle it out. This is going to go well into camp. And I hope they both come back with a even better command of the offense and, and throwing even better and making better decisions. But I look at this takeaway. My takeaway is that if, if as long as Sark is able to keep them both there. That's a win for the season because I do have two good quarterbacks. I feel like we have two good quarterbacks. I'm I'm comfortable I in saying that. And I, I think that's that's a good thing, um, all things considered. I do have one critique before we move on to the next point. Okay. Hudson Card should have played with the ones. They should have rotated. I don't I, I don't think that should have been a competition as, you know, Casey's team versus Hudson's team, because they're both competing against different defenses. Like Casey Thompson obviously got to work with the number one offense exclusively, and but he's also going against the number one defense. And Hudson Card is working exclusively with the twos, but he's going against the number two he's defense. The number two defense, yep. Right? But, you know, the number two defense is pretty good. Yeah. You got people on there. Alfred Collins is on the number two defense. Anthony Cook's on the number two defense. Vernon Br- Broughton. You know, Darian Dunn. Like, there's a lot of people on number two defense that are really, really good. And he was moving the ball and, and had some success. I'm saying that, though, because I, I noticed in other spring games, like the LSU spring game, they made the quarterbacks work with both groups. And I think that's a very fair way to, to look at it. Like, I wanted to see, does Hudson Card have any rapport with Jordan it's, Whittington and so things of that sort? To back your claim up on that is one of the things that they said on the live broadcast was saying, hey, the the offense will kind of dictate who's going to start start for mm. And mm-hmm. even the defense will even have a say in that too. So to have a fair evaluation, you should have them go against the same type of competition at that time. So if you're going to be playing with, if the starter is going to be playing with the starters, he should get some some reps on there and should be going against the higher end, higher end of defense and coverages that they're going to be playing against. So I agree with you that they should. It, it, the quarterback shouldn't have been a pick the team. It should have just been like a, a rotate the quarterback type of thing. I agree. Yeah, and that was the only position I needed to see rotated. If they wanted yep. to lock in everybody else on the di- different teams, totally fine with that. But the quarterbacks should have should have been rotated um, for for both their sakes, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is something you know we're going to judge as fans out of the lens of only what we saw. That whole team and that staff is judging from what they've seen over the course of the entire spring. Um, now, one of the things that played into this, and I'm glad we got a lot of ones versus ones, because it does give us an, a better ability to assess how different position groups are looking. PK, I, I, hey, I'm st- I'm buying even more stock on what I'm seeing with some of the blitzing. They, it, it, if that's what we're going to get in terms of the type of pressure they're putting on quarterbacks, not just pressure in terms of pass rush but coverage i thought they complemented each other very well and that's something that was a concern for me 
Terry Joseph coming in as like our past game coordinator, working with Pete Kwiatkowski. They come from two different kind of schools of, of thought on, on coverage and stuff. I thought both both the secondary, Thompson, Jamison, we saw Jaron Thompson out there, and then we got Dominic Coburn, Ojimo, like all these. I liked what I saw with the with the defense. So I started laughing just a second ago because when you're talking about blitzes, we saw obviously they love they love what they see from a blitzing perspective from from Anthony Cook because I saw four or five that he came from different you know weak side and strong side coming towards the blitz things like that. But one was we actually blitzed from Egypt and we got home and got the sack. <laughs> so, uh, but the thing is, it, it was timed up. It was like, you saw him already running. It wasn't, he, we waited till the snap happened and he was running from 30 yards, uh, 30 yards out. Right. He, right. Already and a he's full, out the full head on sprint. Yeah. So, I mean, just, just, just the, uh, and one other thing I'm going to call out too is, is the tackling has gotten better. One, one play I can call out specifically was Deshaun Jameson against Bijan was he didn't try to just go for legs. I mean, a uh, feet tackle or try to body him. He grabbed him by his thigh and spun him, which that's exactly where you, because that's the mid, that, that, that's the midpoint of a, a runner's body. And that, that way you could utilize your momentum to take him down. So things like that is like, I, I, I liked seeing not huge runs get broken off or anything like that. But, you know, if we were going to tackle someone, we were wrapping up and trying to uh, take, take them down. Uh, I we were going to be in for a long day after the first couple runs, but they mm-hmm. actually held, I think, Bijan only five yards of carry. You got, you got to think of this as well. Is the defense almost scored as many points as the offense did. Mm-hmm. There was no touchdowns this this whole day. Three touchdowns. One of them was one of them was a pick six. So I mean, the, I think the defense did did a, a pretty strong job. Uh, defense line owned owned the offensive line for the most part of the game. I, I, you may have saw something different than I did, but I, I, I thought that they they definitely won the majority of the reps. Um, Ojimo had, I think, two or three sacks. There, there's quite a few sacks on there. Yeah, they're the little touch sacks, but, you know, it's still they got home and they got the they pressure. They created them as a sack. Yes, yeah. yeah. So, so I, I came away. I, I thought that they, uh, uh, you know, Brent, Prince Dorba seemed like he was all over the place. Jet Bush seemed like he was all over the place. Like our, our our linebacking crew looked really good, and we didn't even see our best one out there, Overshone. That's what I was so. going to get to. So the reason why I didn't put the linebackers in here, and I and I, is more so because we don't really know. Like I think right now, a given is is possibly David Benda and Ray Thornton. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and, and Ray Thornton looked looked. I liked how comfortable he looked um, dropping into coverage, and and so and then. At being asked to rush the passer, he's playing a very, very uh, critical position that we didn't really ask our our guys to do last season. So that's what's going to give us our hybrid look between you know whether we look like a three man front or a four man front is is, a, is really based around raised responsibilities. But overall, with the linebacker, you're right. Overshone is not here, so I can't factor him into what he's really going to be asked to do because. I think what you asked Jalen Ford and David Bender to do is a little different from what you're asking. Yeah, the Marvion Overshawn to hundred percent. So I, I don't know what that looks like yet. I, I'm a, I think I'll be comfortable typing defense once I know DeMar, what Demarvion Overshawn brings to the table and and what the linebacker the linebacker situation is very fluid right now. Put it that way. But I know what I got on my D line, mm-hmm. especially my interior pressure. And this this goes for the first and second units. They were they were impressive all day. And I don't think it's just because of inconsistencies with the offensive line. I don't. I think the offensive line had their struggles, and we'll get to to that here too. But I I feel like the defensive line. One of my my big takeaways is just I think they're going to give a lot of people hell this year. And I thought they they came along quite good last year. I think this year with the additional creativity that PK is going to bring to this conference. And then you have people like Shark back there. You have people like Josh Thompson, Keaton Crawford, Darian Dunn. They have some good corners. Chris Adam Moore is a good nickel. Anthony mm-hmm. Cook is a good – Anthony Cook has is, is become very, very good. Up. At, he He's is. They have seen, a lot of dudes yeah. back there. 
and I, I liked I just like how they they seem to to be on a better chord than what we saw you know with Todd Orlando of, or, at the beginning or, of last year too mm -hmm. specifically at the beginning and that's what that's what spring practice is so important especially for a new staff so you know it, we we looked we looked pretty I I was I was I was happy I was happy with our defense and the way they looked all right point four I'm gonna start speeding this up a little bit because we, we we're being chatty. <laughs> um, so I mentioned this before with Casey Thompson, it came out, they were heavy 12 personnel it was Kay Brewer and, and Jared Wiley out there both playing. And you even saw this with Gunnar Helm and Malcolm Epps on the white team. And then you saw this later with Juan Davis being included. Texas has a, and then, and then we, you know, Jatavian Sanders, wherever He's he decides. On the horizon. Well, right. <laughs> so. The reason why I say this, and I had made the analogy to the Cleveland Browns. I look at how they played last year with and with Baker Mayfield, Nick Chubb, and Kareem Hunt, and that dominant run-blocking offensive line, but they did use a lot of 12 personnel, what Stefanski liked to do. I saw a lot of those same concepts, Tran, with what Sark was doing, with especially with Casey. Now, when to open for Hudson Card, it was more 11 personnel. And that's where Kai Money was coming into play and re yep. really eating from the slot. And so it, it was a little bit different. And now the 11 personnel, they got more into RPO stuff. But I think regardless, whether it's Casey Thompson or Hudson Card, 12 personnel is going to be a factor here because you're, the wide receiver core is not set yet. I believe that the offensive line them having the issues that they're having on the edge, especially in pass pro, they're going to need tight ends to play. I also believe that that gives you your best personnel on the field to help Bijan run the football and some of the things they can do from a blocking standpoint. Um, I expect to see a lot of 12 personnel yep. based on, on, on what I saw and how Juan Davis and some, some of these guys, like Juan Davis and Gunnar Helm, they let him play right now. Yeah, that's what's so, that's surprising and good. As as you know, I'm a card carrying member of the Jared Wiley fan club. He needs to do good. better on pass pro, or else his ass ain't gonna play. Yeah, he need, he needs to do better on pass pro because that that blitz that we were talking about earlier from Egypt, he Jared got blown Thompson. up by Jaron Thompson, pushed back, and he made the sack. You can't do that to a safety. I'm sorry. You can't, you can't do it. And, you know, like I said, I'm the biggest fan of his, but that, that's, that's unacceptable. He, he has to, because I, I think he could be, I think he could be an NFL draft pick as a tight end for us. If he's able to pick up those blocks and he's able to get those catches, the, the, the move the sticks for us. So, you know, I don't mind us playing 12 personnel at all. I think it actually benefits us with our running backs. And our receivers, um, I, I don't think we have a receiver yet that on campus right now that could just break down a uh, breakdown and just smoke someone off off of their route running ability yet. Um, maybe maybe Dixon, maybe Dixon could do that. Maybe but Dixon can do it. Yeah. yeah. Um, Joshua Moore's been too inconsistent. Maybe maybe Whittington, because I see a lot of separation every time they're passing to Whittington, but. I wouldn't say that we had that, and with that, you know, it's it's. I, I know this, this. I know uh, what you're talking about, though. Yeah. You're talking more like what Judy and 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 Devontae yeah. Smith were mm -hmm. doing, where it's like six yard separation mm -hmm. off of a off of let's say a a eight yard route, eight yard route, <laughs> like you know mm -hmm. that that type of separation, and and uh, with that, with us going through twelve personnel, we're gonna have to have someone who can who can get open quickly. So we can get those the ball out and let them let them be an athlete and make a play. So I I, I believe. It, look, I'm not trying to take shots at, at at Jared Wiley or whatever, but he needs to be more consistent. We were banging the table for him to be tight end one. I'm right there with you and part of the fan club, mm -hmm. and I think there's there's a lot of potential. But for as big as he is, and 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 now he's had that physical development, you can't get pushed around by. I completely agree with you. I think that also all the people that are critical of Cade Brewer playing so much all the time. This is 
This is why. Cade, that yeah. doesn't happen to take Cade Brewer. He's more, I mean, he's just more consistent right now in, in, in some of those responsibilities that don't kill you. Now, what you're asking, I'm glad Kay Brewer is, you know, we, he's taking care of his physical conditioning. He's got his weight back down to where he was um, around his sophomore year, which is really encouraging to see. But for everybody complaining about Kay Brewer playing so much, when things like that are happening to Jarrett Wiley, that's why Kay Brewer is playing. And if I'm going to try, and then I got these young boys back here that can make some things happen. Like Juan Davis is like, he's already looking like what, if you ever, if they ever like put some more weight on little Jordan Humphrey and moved him to more of a hybrid role, that's what Juan Davis looks like. Yeah. And he's a football player. Like he could play defense. So Gunner, Gunner, you know, they're talking about him and and John Elway and, and some of the things that they were talking about, like, these are dudes, like, if you're not handling your responsibility, they will put them in. And and they've, they, they've, there's been notes throughout spring. Like, this isn't, yesterday wasn't necessarily a surprise to see them play, but, like, there's been notes that those young boys are, are ahead of schedule at tight end. And we're missing one other name, too. <laughs> I mean, we've said him three times. Jatavion Sanders. There's, yep. He's, and, there's and, a reason and Braden, why he's a star. Yeah. And, yeah, and Braden Lybrock too is out yep. there too. Like, there's that tight end crew is 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 competition. Deep. Yeah. Now, some of the things we were talking about. Let's get right to the facts. Xavier Worthy commits to Texas, uh, way of Michigan. Now, <laughs> things we were we were we were we were lacking. Trans laughing because he knows what I'm getting to. Um. Xavier Worthy, for those who are unfamiliar, was a top 50 overall player in this past class. Arguably Michigan's best recruit. I don't know. Things went sideways, paperwork, all this type of stuff. And this is how I know, Tran, we're starting to get back in business when people start accusing us of cheating. Because when's the last time we got we we, we got hammered like this for a, for, for a player? Because people are like, Sark you know, and the Mike Roach stuff for, for those that didn't hear about it. He got mocked to go to Texas before I think his name was even in the portal. <laughs> and, so, and so now it's like, yo, like there's Michigan people that are like big mad. Like, yo, like he contacted him before he got the portal. And I'm saying all this to say crime pays. No, what I'm saying is, <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is, you know you got a good football player when people are pissed off like that. And this mm-hmm. reminds me this this reminds me of when we got Devin Duvernay from Baylor. We got a player we really weren't supposed to get. It turned out great for us. This brother Worthy is being comp to Deshaun Jackson. So a lot of the things that Tran was talking about in terms of that separation mm-hmm. and you know just the inconsistencies we have right now at the wide receiver position, the Worthy commitment is right on time right on time. And as of making this video, uh, I believe the brother Devin Richardson. Yep. Freshman yeah. All-American. Freshman all, Former freshman All-American, only think played one game last year, who was a linebacker. So these positions where there's been a little un- uncertainty, a little, they're hitting the portal like Chris Beard is doing with basketball. And I'm here for it. They're not going to sit content because I'm going to get to something else here in a second, which actually, let's just do that now, which is the sixth takeaway, Tran. Okay. And this goes into what the coaches are seeing. And this is kind of me and you talking about this yesterday and today. We got talent. We do. Like, we have we have talent to, to, to compete for a Big 12 championship. In my opinion, we do. But when you watch the Ohio States and the Alabama, and I'm talking about just the spring games, and I, I'm going to say this. If you watch OU spring game and you saw the way Caleb Williams looked, there's levels to this in terms of NFL people and people that look like future NFL players. I'm looking at LSU. I see that brother uh, uh, McGlutherin and yeah. Derek Stingley out there. How many people look like that on Texas outside of B. John Robinson right now? So Steve Sarkeesian and this staff, they're not going to wait for, oh, I need more recruiting classes, all this stuff. Nah, we got to hit this thing now because they know they need to win now. And so the the talent 
in my opinion, and this goes to the portal thing, Tran, I think that's where they, they, they you know, it's, it's an area of emphasis, I, I would say. These coaches that we have aren't stupid. They see what's going on in the landscape of uh, college football right now. They know they'll probably lose a few players to to uh, to the portal. But they, they're also seeing people who they're going against from a recruiting perspective are doing well right now. And them having to be to show success year one is extremely important. It's almost more important than than when Charlie Strong was here first year, and also uh, and also Tom Herman was first year. Because I agree. You're, look, you're, look, you're looking at A and M. A and M's coming off of nine one season. They, and they have mm-hmm. yeah they have back to back wins. That's your main uh, Oklahoma. Just constantly, you can mark their name down almost for for a a, a Big Twelve championship at this point. That's the team you're playing directly against. Iowa State, maybe ranked in the top five, at least the top ten. Iowa State uh-huh. will at least, I, in my opinion, in my opinion, I know I can have this argument with college football nerds. Shout out to the homies, uh, Daniel, Josh, but we can have this. They didn't have them in there. I I have Iowa State in my top ten. Especially coming off of, they return everybody. Yeah, they're the only team that's returning more players uh, from last year is Louisiana. Yes. Yeah, and we play both of them. Yeah. So, but to your Oklahoma point, and this is a conversation that RJ and I have had on, on over on his channel. This is OU, OU, like the way we felt about Texas probably last year with everything kind of, which is why Tom Herman ultimately got fired for failing to meet those expectations, even though we only lost three games by 13 points and all that type of stuff was because we thought that was the, that was the year where the roster dictated that everything should be put together. That's how Oklahoma feels this year. This year. Like there's going to be a lot of people that are going to rank Oklahoma number one in the country to open, to start the season. And it will be justified yeah, it's absolutely with what they've justified. done. Yeah. From the portal, the fact that they got the ramp year out the way for Spencer Rattler, he's good to go now. They got Kennedy Brooks coming back. They already got the transfer. They already hit the portal again to get the receiver to, pl- to replace Bridges. Grinch has everything he's needed now with two recruiting classes. This is Oak- this is supposed to be Oak- – this is the most expectations Lincoln Riley will have, in my opinion, coming into a season. There's no excuses anymore about the playoff stuff. There really isn't for, o- for OU. But I'm hitting on that from a Texas perspective because, to your point, Tran, this, that's who you have to compete against if you're Steve Sarkeesian. And Steve Sarkeesian can't wait. Yeah. Like, if he knows I, I can't line up like this in Dallas, like, I need to get some some speed or whatever I need to get. I need to get here now. They can lose to him. Don't, don't get that twisted. They could lose to Oklahoma. However, can they can, – will they have those – are you kidding me? Losses to a TCU team that should be outmatched. Can't, I agree. Uh, as long as they, they put a good product on the field that they could sell, that's the issue. That's the difference between everything else on, on this recruiting path because they're, they're coming into year one. Do a lot of teams expect Texas to go to the playoffs? Do, does it, do you expect Texas in year to go one? to the playoffs? No. In year one? No. no. Let's, no. let's be real. The Vegas over under for Texas right now is seven and a half wins, I believe, for next year. So there you go. And a twelve game schedule. So that means like it's like, do you think this is an eight and four football team? And I think that that's for year one, that's like that that's not why you fired Tom Herman. Cause if you think about it, Tom Herman in a ten game season won seven games. And, you know, granted that was all including the bowl. But if you take away the bowl and they played the normal twelve game schedule which means that they actually play Kansas and South Florida. Now he's looking at nine and three. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Like he really should have been nine and three because he didn't get to play his cupcakes. So that you're, 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 you're going to see Sarkeesian to say the scheme, because the talent is good enough with in combination with the scheme to beat anybody. Yes. In my opinion. But if you want to, to, increase your your margin for error if you will you need more talent you need as you need the best players you can possibly get you're talking about you're talking about anyone on our schedule right 
because I don't think we I don't think we could beat Alabama right now. No, no, no. I'm saying anybody on our schedule. Okay, I, gotcha, agree gotcha, I agree with you. I agree with you. And this gotcha. is us just being honest of where we are right now. But anybody on our schedule. Okay. Um, OU is going to be favored. They should be. Yes. Should oh, be. Iowa State will be favored. They should at be. home should be. Yes. Should be right. So, uh, 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 but my whole bigger point on this is. Just because the NFL talent may be not crazy. And when we're, we're, we're talking about NFL talent, do I think a lot of these dudes on, on our team currently will play in the NFL? Yes. When I'm talking about NFL talent, I'm talking about day one or high day two picks. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about people being undrafted free agents or six or seven round picks. That's not yeah. NFL talent. I'm talking about real people that are going to start in the NFL. That's what I'm talking about. You go watch Ohio State's spring game. And Texas fans, I implore you, please, There's all these spring games are being uploaded on YouTube. There's no reason why you can say you don't know what's going on in another program. I would at least watch, at the minimum, who we're going to play, just so you can get familiar, familiarize yourself with the people we're going to have to go up against. Louisiana's is on there. I've already seen theirs. I was watching OU's. So you there's there's to familiarize yourself. But if you really want to audit yourself against the, the the teams, go watch Ohio State spring game and look at Olave and and Marvin Harrison Jr. and Garrett Wilson. Those are NFL players. Mm-hmm. It's, it, we don't have people that look like that right now. That's not, I'm not trying to disrespect Jordan Whittington or Joshua Moore or Kai Money or anybody on our team. But there's levels to this. And so if Texas wants to get to that level – you need to go get people like Xavier Worthy. And Sark knows this. That's why I'm that's why I'm actually encouraged by them. And they need to do that that, that same type of eyeball needs to be taken at the offensive line as well, in my opinion. I agree. Last thing I want to hit on before we wrap. And this kind of ties everything up from what we saw yesterday. And shout out to the homie Tex over on uh, Inside Texas because I was reading some of his stuff today. I love the Inside Texas side, but I was reading some of his stuff today. Yeah. And he made a fantastic point, um, Tex that is, about Keandre Coburn. I agreed with him. Look dominant, but is he, but in terms of his size and his weight, he is not in the best physical condition to where he can be the best player he can possibly be. And Texas' whole point was, are you a 30-snap defensive tackle or are you a 55-snap guy? And that point really resonated with me because I, th- I thought the brother, you know, there were times where Casey Thompson would turn around off a of fake and 99 was in his right. face. Man, in his face, yep. And he's had reps like that before in games. He had a 15, what, 12 for 15 tackle game last season. But then there's other games where he, he, you know, Tavondre Sweat has to come in a little sooner than you'd like. This goes for all, especially the big fellas in our program. This is the most important summer of your lives, in my opinion, to get yourself in the right physical condition. And Tran, in my opinion, it's not necessarily their fault because the previous regime under Yancey McKnight and what Tom Herman wanted, they wanted to bulk people up. They were big on strength, all that type of stuff. Clearly, this regime feels differently. Look at Jordan Whittington's body already. But the body composition thing, Tran, and I know that's a huge thing that you focus on. Just talk to me about that and, and what needs to occur this summer. So, it, to me, it looks like uh, it looks like the uh, strength and conditioning coach wants more explosive, which, you know, he could be 350 and be explosive. However, I don't want him. Because that's unnecessary pain on his joints. I mean, I think I think last year you asked me, you asked me uh, myself and um, and Brandon about uh, Yancey McKnight having them max out three days before a game, like in squat. And I was I, I just sent over the laughing face emoji to you. I was like, why would he have them do that? And he said, why? Uh, you said I honestly have no idea why he, uh, why he wouldn't do it. And I said, and during the season, you never max out. Because your whole body, your whole body goes through so much, so much during a game that what you want to do is you want more functional stuff. So Mm -hmm. for him, if he's able to slowly go down on 315 and then explode up with it, 
that's huge for him. If he could do, if he could do like 15 reps of that, that's, that's way better than him doing a 600 pound squat, honestly. Uh, because the things that you want to see is you want to see him blow off the ball and be in the quarterback's face, like you were seeing. So his 350 weight, I would honestly like to see him around 330, 335. And then maybe when he's testing for the NFL, um, 320 to 325 range, but just explosive. Um, things that – if that's if that's the prerogative of the strength and conditioning coach, I forgot his name, the guy from Cal. Uh, oh, Beck, Coach Becton. Becton, yeah. Uh, if Becton wants, wants that that way, you know, I feel that – his leadership, because it, there was something that was said, there was a quote of his where he's saying, I've won at every single level. And this is Coburn we're talking about specifically. Mm -hmm. I've won at every single level. I won't let us lose. Which that shows to me a, a different side of him that we haven't seen is, is him stepping up as a leader. If that's what Coach Beckton wants him to do, I think he'll get it done, honestly. Uh, I love because, Coburn's leadership, by the way. It's just, it's just... He's the example I'm using because I feel like there's several people on this roster who, you know, they're four, only, what, four months into Becton's program. I think by month seven, month you know, eight, when the season comes it, around, it, right? It takes a lot to change to change someone's body composition. People think that it, it should happen over a month. No, it takes a little while. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's a mixture of both diet and what – what is prescribed to them for their workouts. Um, so I, I really, I, I'm really, I'm really, ha I would be happy with him at 335 as playing weight because it's going to be hard for, because he looks like he's just a solid dude. He doesn't look like he's a, he's a, just a, like a fat guy just out there. You know what I'm he saying? Doesn't look, yeah, I yeah, agree with you. He looks solid. He looks, he looks like a tank out there. Um, so if he lost 15 pounds, cause you, you the, you want to lose some of the fat weight for 15 pounds because he could probably drop 20 pounds sitting in the sauna for 45, 45 minutes. That's not the type of weight you want him to lose. You want him to be healthy with the strength um, and you don't want him to deplete himself like a fighter would do type of thing. So you right. want to lose it the right way and uh, losing even for a guy, his size, losing 30 pounds. It, it, it's going to take a little while if it's the right, if it's the right weight. Yeah, and and this again, this this is for all our big folks. Uh, uh, the backs, Bijan Robinson, his body looks great. great. Roshan Johnson, his body has has undergone some crazy things over the last couple of years. He looks fantastic. There's there's guys on our team who are already there. There's guys on our team, Michael Mary or Jake Smith or Derek Kerstetter, who we just need them to get 100 percent and get healthy. Alfred Collins, I I put in there as well. Um, and then you also this this is this summer. Whether it's Casey Thompson or Hudson Carden, we'll end here. That rapport of leading those workouts, and when I'm talking about workouts, we're talking about seven on sevens. And I think this needs to be inclusive of the defensive guys as well, um, because that's how you get that culture that they have at Bama, at Ohio State and LSU. That that fraternity, like where you have a Derek Stingley working on a Jamar Chase and a Justin Jefferson, ever, or, or, or you know. Kerry Vincent Jr. out there working with those guys, like, and everyone's pushing everybody to get better, um, you know, or encouraging everyone to get better. I mean, right. think, think of Alabama, that Alabama story of Najee Harris driving from Dallas to be there for his his guys' pro days, just to be there and and, and you know provide his support with them. So, mm -hmm. and I, that I really because when we were talking about this, I was talking about just you know them just doing the walkthroughs and just getting the the chemistry down between the quarterback and the wide receiver. Yeah, because she, cause it, your point was about timing. Yeah, it was about timing it, because uh, there was a lot of timing routes that you, uh, during the, uh, during the spring game. And even, even the uh, Hudson card was a, was a timing route. He was eyeing down Marcus Washington the entire time. So um, getting those down, but you know, you even one up that you're like, Hey, get all the cornerbacks and run a seven on seven against them. You know, no, no contact. Of course, just just make sure you have that competition where you're going. You're going against the best. You know, so I I agree completely completely with you because that only that only built. You know what you're supposed to be doing. You know the plays that you're supposed to be running. So just go out there and just get as much reps as in as you can. If you're Devonte Smith or Jalen Waddle, 
you can't tell me that those reps are Henry Ruggs or Jerry Judy, those reps against Sertan and Diggs when Diggs was there, that they, they didn't make each other better. You're not going to see, like, if I'm Jamar Chase, I'm not going to see another Derek Stingley when I play, so I should cook this guy. You know what I mean? Like, that, I think that stuff is is really, really dope, and I think Texas needs to have that. Like, I'd love to see Deshaun Jameson and guys like that involved. I'm not saying that they're not doing that. I'm just saying, like, this is the summer where they've got to get closer than ever before, regardless of who the quarterback is, to establish that rapport. Um so that they can have the season that they want to have. For those, I know we went longer than expected, but and, and we touched on those seven things. We are going to do a live where it's really just going to be more open-ended. We address yeah. what you guys want to address. Um, but these takeaways aren't just, and I know we didn't hit on every player, or every position group, but these are just like more of the big picture things Tran and I are, are thinking about and been discussing since, since the game occurred yesterday um we will have brad counter on our live with us so um you'll be you guys will be able to talk to bk make sure you help get us to um make sure y'all go subscribe to bk's channel subscribe brad counter yeah, he did a live job. yesterday he did a live yesterday yeah, after the game um help us get to 10k we appreciate it but let us know what were some of your big takeaways not just the quarterback stuff everybody's gonna I said it before, if you're a card guy or Casey Thompson guy, you can use stuff from yesterday to validate your guy. Um, but for the team, what's best for the team, right? What are some of the takeaways? Because there was a lot, there's still a lot to unpack from what we saw yesterday and things we were hearing from the entire spring practice. Tran, I appreciate you, brother. Thanks for joining appreciate me again. You, man. Always. <laughs> Always Anytime. a blast. It was a blast yesterday. And um, hopefully we'll be able to create some really nice memories um, being in person and being able to see some more football this fall. Guys, remember, horns always up.